watching Life in the Law. We are 1 to 1.30 in Think Tech Hawaii. We are very lucky today to have a, a, a guest, uh, Victor Gemignani, who uh, for a long time worked for Legal Aid, but is now the executive director was it the, was it of the Hawaiian Apple, Hawaii Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. Actually co-director with my partner, Gavin Thornton. Okay, co-director, so we want to get that straight. We're on a, uh, a uh, downwards uh, trend of my service in the program over. Okay. At some point I'll retire, so he's my succession, succession okay. plan. Okay. Well, we'll have to have him on, too, yeah, sometime. He's a super guy. Um, so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit today about, well, d well did, first of all, did you hear that um, the federal court um, uh, struck down the executive here. order? Yeah, I here. did not. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. Derek I did not. I Watson. Was up today. I don't know if you know the yeah. judge. I don't yeah, know, I know the, the judge. judge. Derek Watson. He's a relatively new appointee. Yeah, he's young. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. So, wonderful. yeah, that, that just came on right before it's we... It's great to have it happen from Hawaii, to be frank with you. It makes a I, statement about who we are it's as a kind, people. It, uh, yeah. It's nice to be... Um, at that stage. It, I, it induced pride in mm -hmm. me. I thought, I, you know, I was proud that it was mm -hmm. my state that was, at, you know, making a statement. So I, I was, yeah, I was pretty happy about that. Yeah, so they, it, it was like hours before it was supposed to go into um, mm -hmm. force, effect. so, mm -hmm. effect, so, yeah. I, I applaud uh, Doug Chin for bringing that case in. He did it with alacrity, yeah. too. Yeah. He did yeah. it really fast, mm -hmm. right? I know. He, d he really did a great job. He really did. Thank well, you, Douglas also, Chin. Uh, a good article in the Civil Beat today about uh, other types of issues he may be interested in, and other Democratic attorney generals in the uh, United States may be uh, interested in terms of pushing back against some of what I consider a fairly extreme agenda of the Trump administration. It, it is an extreme yeah. agenda. You know, I uh, was involved, I, I told you, I think, earlier with uh, representing uh, marijuana uh, uh, purveyors in Hawaii, mm -hmm. medical marijuana purveyors. And, you know, I really think that one of their agendas, one of Jeff Sessions' agendas, is going to try to be a pushback on that. No, on guarantee. That. Yeah. Guarantee. I mean, it just guarantee. goes along with the whole guarantee. package of... But it's like a lot of issues that have changed over the years. Uh, as people have, uh, I think, matured in their thinking, uh, gay marriage is a classic example, uh, slowly the tide changes against what used to be. Right. Uh, and I think, to be frank with you, for better for all of us as... Uh, those rights are, are recognized and enforced. I think so. Um, so ultimately, I think uh, Jeff Sessions is going to be on the wrong side of law, the wrong side of the history. He can't push, uh, push back again. Well, I think the results of where we've been have been. Uh, right. I don't uh, see how you unwind that. Yeah. Uh, you, I really don't think you, you know. can. No, I don't think you can. You chip away either. about it, make it a little more difficult on the states. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, maybe doctors a little bit. But for all intents and purposes, the population has been that was a decision, I think, uh, after Colorado started uh, uh, decriminalization, a state uh, uh, issue, uh, not necessarily as much of a federal issue as it used to be, where right. they used to have exclusive domain. Right. Now it's a state issue, and when you get into the states, you're going to have a series of different decisions made by the local population and local political structure, right. which I think are more appropriate uh, for their local population. Um, and therefore, I don't think the feds are, have the energy or the handles that they used to have uh, or the backing. Uh, well, that's to, good to hear. Uh, that's good because people are really, you know, pretty concerned yeah. about that yeah. because it's really fledgling here yeah. too. So, it's, so I lived know. through the Reagan administration. Uh, I think we all did, and uh, I, I was in the Legal Services Corporation inside Washington Legal Services Corporation when he decided that he wanted to fund as one of the top priorities the entire federal program that uh, supports legal services, legal aid funding in the country. So I was up close and personal to watch exactly what he did in terms of trying to get that done and the resistance he met and his failure ultimately to be able to succeed in that agenda. So I've learned a lot of things through that uh, transition and that's that uh, the high point may be the inauguration, although in this case the inauguration speech was such a disaster, I'm not even sure that was the I, nice I, I agree, but you know, it, when, when people were so disturbed by this election, I, 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 w I was a teenager, but, uh, but I remember Nixon's election and everybody was disconsolate. Absolutely. I mean, it was really, really hard to take. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, it's not, it's, we've been through this yeah. before. We really, really have. So You still need a Congress. And yeah. You need a cooperative Congress. And although right. it may be totally Republicans, I'd like to see them thread the needle on this health care, uh, particularly in the Senate. It's impossible to I do. I don't think so. So that's a failed program, same as Clinton tried under uh, uh, Hillary Clinton when she first came right. uh, in, the, in the Clinton beginning of the Clinton administration back in the early 90s. She tried for two years to get health care through. It just didn't go through. It's highly complex, especially when you're talking about eliminating a vast number of millions of people off the rolls and, in fact, increasing the cost significantly on some vulnerable populations, particularly right. the elderly and, the, and uh, the low income. You just can't do that anymore. So bottom line is I think that 
the uh, uh, prayer that they're going to be able to significantly uh, change the Affordable Care Act is really not going to happen. No, I don't think so. so. I yeah. think it's a lot of talk, but I don't think they'll, yeah. because they, they have pressure from the left and yeah. the right. Exactly. So. exactly. Exactly. I, you know. Pretty much the same thing the Democrats had when they pushed it through I guess, eight I guess, years ago, I guess seven so. years ago. Yeah, I guess so, but this, but now we have something, exactly. so it's, it's it, again, it's hard to, to go begin. back, right, hard exactly, exactly. Begin. It's yeah. entrenched and yeah. people, people have an expectation yeah. and, and, and... It's fair, you've got a lot more people on health care, which I is know. what we all want. Maybe cost right. some people more right. money, but, you know, we needed to have coverage for as many people as we possibly could in this country. I personally think health care is such a critical component of just life, that it's an entitlement. Uh, yeah. And we ought to have a system that provides adequate and timely and appropriate uh, hair care to our citizens that are vulnerable with the uh, challenge by health. I mean, I've had some health issues in myself in my life, and they come on with no uh, uh, history uh, right. or warning, and they could be absolutely devastating. And imagine, I can't imagine if, I, if my health problems I've gone through, if I didn't have co competent medical services, my life right. would be hopeless. Right. I'd be dead. Like, right. and How do you do that? How do you means test? Uh, a critical right like health care. Right. That it's like a fundamental right it's almost. Fundamental right like the that. right to house. I believe the right to housing is yeah. a fundamental yeah. right. Although the court doesn't agree with me. So. It never will, but I, I agree with you, but <laughs> it's never going to happen. But, you know. um, so let's talk a little bit. You know, um, I, as I said, we had a, an interesting discussion at the women's meeting that I attended uh, a week ago about. Uh, economic rights and you know this was a group of you know upper middle class you know very well-meaning liberal women but there was one woman who what was working class and she's the one who raised her hand and said you know we need to talk about uh how all these all our civil rights are impacted by um economic disparity so and i love the quote you have on your page by barbara ehrenreich the Poverty is just a lack, a shortage of funds. It's mm -hmm. not a character flaw. How do we get to the place where we, back to the late 19th century, we sort of, you know, where not that difficult. If you understand the core problems on economic justice in our state, and we all suffer from them, and by the way, we're probably all aware of them. We just hadn't necessarily connected the dots. But although we all suffer from them, the low and uh, moderate income suffer even more because of the three factors. The three challenges are really simple highest cost of living nation, state in the nation, right. highest cost or maybe second highest to New York, I may give you that, in terms of shelter, electricity, food, 162% more than people in the mainland pay as an average in food. So the stats on cost of living in the state are off the charts, the worst in the United States. The second factor we all suffer from economically is we have the lowest wages paid in the United States. It's amazing. When you factor in cost of living, our minimum wage that we pay right now, even after three bumps, is the lowest in the United States because cost of living permeates the entire thing. I'm sure. It, so, that was stunning to me when I came stunning here. Stunning to me when I came here 25 years ago yeah. also. It's you part know. of the price of paradise. We accept right. many, many lower wages for, I'm not sure why, but we, it happens. I think our system basically has grown up that way for a lot of different reasons. It also is a little bit of a, uh, a, a hedge on growth. Uh, population right. growth. I think it's it such is an incredible dis place to right. live. It's a but bottom line is we still have to live. We all get paid less, significantly less, the worst in the United States, I might add, as an average, uh, in terms of the wages we're paid in comparison to people we, on the mainland. And the third issue is we have the second worst tax policy in the United States that hits the low and moderate income people. We're the only state but Washington State in, 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 uh, in, on the mainland that is worse in terms of taxing our low and moderate income people because our GET is 45% of all of the revenues raised in the state. Half of the entire budget of the state comes from GET. It's the broadest GET or sales tax in the entire United States. Wow. And that takes much, much more money out of the lower income because they don't have much more money to spend. Right. And it leaves us with a situation with the people in the lower 20% of our income bracket in our, in our state pay about 13 cents out of every dollar in taxes. And the people at the high 20, the top 20 percent, pay about 8 cents, almost half of what the lower income is paying. So you have the highest cost of living, you have the lowest wages, you have the second highest tax policy in the United States. Those are the challenges, the economic challenges go to the core of survival for all of us, but as I would say, uh, right. for if the low and moderate income people even more, especially seniors, retired seniors that are fixed income or disabled individuals. So if you want to solve, solve the problem, you have to start taking a look at each of the components of that and seeing how we dig ourselves out of this hole that we've created. Very difficult. Housing obviously is one of the critical right. components. We have 43% uh, of our people in the state are renters. 
Uh, they're paying, it's the highest cost burden state in the, in the nation, which means our people are paying more for rent than any other place in the United States. Uh, here's a figure that'll knock your socks off. 75% of people that are at poverty in this state are paying more than 50% of their income on shelter. Oh. Remember, they're all, we're talking poverty, which is probably fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year. That's going to leave them after taxes, somewhere neighbor to five or $6,000 to support three to four kids for the rest of the entire year because the rent is just so enormous right. that they pay. Right. So you've got to deal with affordable housing in a serious way, and there's a whole series of things we could do in that, in that arena. To and there are people that. that are doing it, I think, too. Yeah, so. but it's very slow and steady. The political system, to be frank with you, is playing catch-up ball on affordable housing. It was an issue in Hawaii back in 2000, 2001, 2002, a lot of concentration. I thought after that it went to sleep and what we started talking about is affordability of home ownership so the entire emphasis on affordability if you look at all of the political uh, uh, commentary all of the political pledges it's on affordable uh, ownership well 43 percent of our people are renters they're never right. going to most of them are never going to aspire to own a house they need rental and we haven't been rental we haven't built rental uh, uh, units in this in no this there's state. a real shortage it's of rental 30 40 units. years has not been any any rental housing built for the low income in the meantime our housing prices have gone up our wages have remained low and the housing gap between what you bring in and what you can afford is just gotten larger and larger and larger and larger so i think the political system now because i think a lot of reaction uh from um people in the street who are uh, worried about the cost of affordability, their families, their kids having to go to the mainland because they can't afford to live here, uh, the whole issue of homelessness, which is the worst in the United States, it's, all driven it's, it's by stunning. homelessness, all driven by cost of, cost of housing. It started to let uh, the politicians know that affordable rental housing is really where they got to put their energy and their money and their, and their property. And there's starting to be some dialogue about that. We've, Appleseed has introduced a lot of models that are uh, aimed to bring the cost of housing significantly down, like that like uh, accessory dwelling units being built in people's backyards right. or micro units being the way that uh, low income housing, moderate income housing is built in the state through the transit oriented development. Um, so a lot of work is being done on economic justice in terms of taxes. And that's really the only way you can get quick money into people that are, that are suffering at the bottom line change their taxes, stop taking as much money out of their taxes. And we've had a series of tax bills at the legislature for the last three years, this year, I think there's a lot of energy. It's, it's gotten more testimony than any uh, any bill ever on these issues, including really? minimum wage. Uh, the testimony has been pouring in from people interested in supporting it uh, to be able to raise significantly lower the tax rate uh, on three different ways oh, let's, for low income. Let's talk about that. I'm going to take a quick break, and let's talk about those ways when we come back. Sure. You're watching uh, Life in the Law. I'm Marion Sasaki. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with Think Tech Hawaii, and I'd like to ask you to come watch my show, The Economy and You, each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hello and aloha. My name is Raya Salter and I am your host for Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and renewable energy future. I'm so excited to be here with you to talk about some of the most important energy issues of our day. And most importantly, who can we bring together? Energy engineers, artists, musicians, accountants, advocates, young people, who can we bring together to talk about how we can make this path together by walking and reach 100% renewable energy? Please join me Tuesdays at 1 p.m. for Power Up Hawaii. Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki. I'm talking with Victor Gemignani about uh, ways to uh, reduce taxes on lower income uh, families, yeah? Really not so, complicated. Okay, so explain it to me because it sounds pretty complicated ways. to me. Not of these. If you start to understand tax policy, we started about three or four years ago when it was new to us. And we were, oh my God, tax policy, yeah. how complicated. Really not that complex when you start to break it down uh, by different uh, solutions that you might be able to find that are replicated in the mainland so you're not uh, discovering the model scratch, here. Yeah. And there are some here that just had gone to, to been atrophied. So there are three major tax credits that are available to low income. Tax credits mean that you get money back from the government. If you pay, first it goes to pay whatever taxes you owe, and if there's any money left over, you get it back. Refundable tax credits, they're the key to, to uh, uh, bringing immediate dollars into low-income families' lives, bang, right away. First is uh, something we got through the legislature uh, two years ago. It was on GET, and it allowed a tax credit 
for low and moderate income individuals that make less than $30,000 a year, un under our plan it was raised to $60,000, uh, to be able to increase the low income uh, uh, GET food credit. Everybody gets the right to take this credit depending upon what their income is. From $85, where it had been stuck since 2008, had not changed, up to $125. And that's per exemption. And it may not seem like a lot of money, but $50 times three mom and two kids, $150 coming in all of a sudden, just uh, does open up options for pay pass bills, get your kids some needed sneakers. Absolutely. Just help Gives a little, you a little bit. bit of breathing That's room. the Menini tax, 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 tax rate that, was, that was a, we were able to get through. Uh, this year it's being sunsetted, so it has to, the sunset has to be uh, ended and we have to continue to have that. When the legislature passed the increase, they only passed it for two years, so we have to make sure that the sunset continues. The second one, which is a big one, is a low-income renter's credit. That has been in existence since the 70s for the same reason. These credits, by the way, exist because there's a recognition, always has been a recognition, that because our government depends upon GET so extensively to raise its revenues, and the, high, the, the, the rate is so high in comparison to other states, they had to in some way ameliorate the regressive nature of these tax increases right. by giving the low income, moderate income some tax relief. And that was the way we're going to raise GET, but we're going to give them some help so that they won't pay, be paying everything. Up front they will, but they'll get it back in tax, tax rebates. That tax a credit for low income renters defined by as anybody that has $30,000 of income, now we are, under us it will be $60,000 if, if the change is done, they, they get $50 per exemption. Nimini. That $50 was last adjusted in 1981. Wow. It's now worth about $18 based upon the inflation that's occurred. So it's pretty much a meaningless tax credit. Right. If you adjusted it just for inflation, regardless, not, not even taking about what we'd like to do in terms sure. of the struggle people are just adjusted for inflation, it would go about $150 a, 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 a cre credit. Again, you have a mom with two kids Low-income renter paying more than $1,000 in rent, which guarantee they are, making less than $60,000. That's a $450 increase they're going to get in terms right. of their paying off their taxes or getting it back in right. their paycheck. That can make a meaningful can make difference. A, on a $14,000, $16,000 before, uh, before a taxes salary, that's a lot of money, especially yeah. when you have two or three kids. The other, the big one that the state has uh, looked at for a number of years but always rejected, the state legislature, but this year may be the year, is creating a state EITC program, Earned Income Tax Credit Program. Yeah, what is that? Federal EITC program was started by President Nixon. We were talking about President Nixon before. Yeah. President Nixon made a decision that he wanted to help low-income wage earners, people that were working, but he didn't want to do it through a welfare program. So he did it through a tax credit, and he called it the Earned Income Tax Credit. It became the, uh, uh, President Reagan increased it, because he loved it also. It goes to low-income wage earners, people that are working. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, uh, President uh, K uh, Clinton made it a top uh, a domestic agenda in his, uh, 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 in his term. Um, so right now, about a quarter of a billion, that's a B, quarter of a billion dollars comes from the federal government every year into pockets of low-income wage earners in Hawaii. A quarter of a billion dollars. It's wow. an enormous federal program. Yeah. And it goes, again, only to those that are struggling between fourteen and twenty-five, twenty-eight thousand dollars a year. You can get it up until, until fifty-two thousand, but the amount you get is Manini. The amount of money that goes into a family of four that's earning fourteen, sixteen, eighteen thousand is, believe it or not, sixty-two hundred dollars a year. That's a tremendous from the amount federal of government. money. That's a thirty to forty percent increase right. after tax dollars to a family that is working minimum wage and barely surviving. Mm -hmm. So the more you less the more family you have, the more children you have, the more your tax credit will be. So it's an enormous tax credit for that and it's targeted. It really targeted at a population that is struggling the most. Right. All struggling, but that's the population no, but that, that, is that is really is struggling. Really, yeah, so it's a way the state can pr spend precious money by funding a state EITC program, same as the federal EITC program. Same people get it, and the, the amounts they're going to get is only a percentage of what they get from the feds. The state EITC programs are funded by 10% or 15% or 20%. District of Columbia has one that's 42% of what the federals pay. They pay you. We're going for 15% increase here, or state-funded program. So if the state were to create a state-funded EITC program, they would join 20 other, six other states, 26 states in the constant, constant, majority of states now have adopted state EITC programs as the easiest way to get money out immediately to low and moderate income families who are workers. And the, normally workers are the most sympathetic of all right, because our wages right. are just so low and minimum wage just doesn't pay them even 
close enough right, to get exactly. out of poverty. They're still working in poverty. They work 40 hours a week. They're still 4,000 under poverty. I know. I mean, that, that's the whole uh, argument, right? People yeah. are supposed to... Uh, th that's a whole welfare argument, right? Exactly. If you're working, you're... Work 40 you're, hours a week, you ought not to be in poverty. Right. We do. Be, Our minimum right. wage leaves them in poverty. Right. A lot of low-income wage earners. And I'm not taking truck with low-income uh, employers that pay low. I think they ought to pay more, but that's their issue in terms of economics. Mm -hmm. I am taking truck with the state that has an opportunity to give back money that they're collecting from low income in a way that will really make a difference in families' lives. And by the way, if you were to add those three figures I just gave up, you're talking probably about $1,500 for a mom and two kids earning 14 grand, 15 grand, 16 grand after tax dollars, they'll get in their pocket after taxes, 15 bucks in their, 15,100 in their pocket. That's, it, it's revolutionary yeah, that's in terms makes, of the, amount, the impact it'll have. And when you take a look at EITC programs, health benefits for the families that get EITC go up, Per, uh, educational proficiency because that's goes what way people up. spend money on. They exactly. don't spend money on. They exactly. spend money on necessities. Exactly. That, you know, that's it's sort of a myth exactly. that people. Exactly. You know, exactly. It raises the child's self-esteem when they have a few things that their their friends have. Uh, they can go to a movie periodically. They feel better about themselves. They learn better. Right. It's a. It's just that economics basically is really clear. If you take a look at the economic, the uh, great performance. To, in schools, private, public, it doesn't matter. It's very much graduated based upon the economic ba place someone is in. I'll give you another issue, by the way. There's an issue that came up about three years ago with the Affordable Care Act. As there is more requirements for evaluation on what hospitals are producing, what is the effect on someone's lives? So the hospitals and the health industry started looking at things called the social determinants of health. And they found out that it's easier to tell what a health person's, what a health, uh, a person's gonna have by knowing what their zip code is than knowing what their DNA is. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Exactly, it's where you live, what food you eat, what schools you go to, the safety of your communities, how you feel about yourself. That affects your health, the stack of stress in your life. That affects your health. So now the health industry is recognized and bought into completely the whole idea of social determinants of health. Well, those social determinants of health can really only be affected by more affordable housing and more income in people's right, pockets. Right. So you bottom line is you go again back to economic justice and the ways you can do that. Right. So this year we have put a money generator into our tax bill. And it's gone through the House uh, and gone through the Senate. So it now will be going through committee. Uh, mm -hmm. We're very excited at this point. We have a lot of testimony behind it. And the tax bill basically to raise the dollars that are required to be able to fund this project, be about $46, $47 million, is a reintroduction of the tax on the top 1% earners in the state. We used to have that tax as of last year, but it was allowed to sunset by the legislature. Really? And about $50, $60 million went back to the top 1%. 93% of that, $50, $60 million, is the top 1%. Uh, the top 2 or 3% got a little bit also. So basically, we're suggesting to the legislature that they go back and reintroduce that tax uh, uh, on the hot, most wealthy in our community and allocate that tax for uh, uh, low-income economic justice issues. And we're starting to get a number of people that would be implement, imp, uh, impacted on it, wealthy individuals in the community coming out in the paper, in the op that we had one the other day uh, uh, by Crystal Rose and, and Randy Moore, saying, you should tax me more. I can afford right. it. You should tax right. me more. So we're hoping that more and more people that are fairly well off in the community will start to saying, you know, I can afford a little bit more taxes as long as it's going to be earmarked for the people that are that struggling right. the most. Th I, that's what, yeah. I, I never understood the press not to pay any taxes. I mean, yeah. it's the price we pay for fundamental civil, you know, roads and schools and libraries. And, and our lifestyle. And our lifestyle, right. Where we so, live and how we live it and who we live it with. So, you know, but so, so do you, do you, are you optimistic about that? First time in four years I've been optimistic. Because really? there's a revenue enhancement. There's a, this legislature is very hard to get money that hasn't already been allocated from some source, so you don't have a target, how are you going to raise it? If you try to go from revenue dollars that are already in the system and divert those for some of the purposes we're suggesting, there's a real kickback from the legislature. I wish that was not so, but that's true. So the, one of the only ways you can really push agendas like this is to have some way you're going to suggest they can raise money to pay for it, so it's revenue neutral. Uh, and this bill, I think, has a, uh, a, clear, a clear way of doing that. Right. In fact, it'll raise a fair amount of money. Their estimates are as high as $75 million that it'll raise, and our costs for our program are only about $45, $46 million. So there's even money left over for other purposes that they think may be necessary. Wow, that would be great. So I think if this legislature has the will 
and here's enough from the population that we really have to do something about this population, and we're going to continue to say the same we see every day in our, in our it streets. It affects and our, everybody. I all mean, of us. Yeah. So uh, I, we're hoping that this year will be the year that they finally say we're going to put some serious money in the low-income population and oh, start good. to reverse the trend we've been doing ever since God knows when. Yeah, I know. When, when uh, Reagan. Yeah. Uh, everything goes back to Reagan, right? Yeah. I mean. <laughs> we could go back farther, but I think <laughs> where I come further. from, my political, that's pretty much, that's a change the whole system. Yeah, he unwound yeah. everything. I it think. was the tax reform he did. Yeah. It was radical in terms of reducing the uh, tax rates on the highest uh, and, earners. And people's and perspectives on what's yeah. okay. What, what, yeah. What's okay to... Exactly. What's... I, what's and fair. Moral, yeah, right, exactly. And they, when they, normally moral, when they right. think of fair, they fear what's fair with me, not fair with what's being cut out in terms of the right. system. We also have government sometimes not as efficient and effective as it ought to be, so people think there's wasted money. And I can see the arguments that they make about why tax me more when it's going to be wasted. But if we can divert it, if we can earmark the money so it's being given for a particular purpose right. that everyone that agrees is difference. essential, then I think we have ultimately a, 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 a significant majority of people will say, let's go that route because we know what's going to happen with this money. It's not going to be eaten up in other government programs. The right. beauty, by the way, of tax policy is you can get money to low-income populations in a number of different ways. You can give them cheaper housing by subsidizing mm -hmm. your housing. You can give them things like food stamps or welfare. People have to know about those programs. They have to feel comfortable applying for those programs. They've got to go to a bureaucracy that makes an application for those programs. Right. They have to wait for a decision from those programs. They have to appeal a wrongful decision from those programs. And they then have to get the check to actually spend the money. That's an expensive process for the state to go through. Sure. Tax policy doesn't go that way. Tax policy doesn't goes cost directly. Anything. It goes. There's no agency that touches right. it except Department of Taxation. Once they get the 1040 that you file or the 10 911 in the state, mathematics is clear. The check goes right out. So it's not. There's no siphoning off of the dollars for the bureaucracy, nor any inefficiencies as the bureaucracy churns through its process of making decisions that they ultimately have to make. That's fascinating. So it's the best way. Tax of all. policy is the most radical way to reorganize. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Easiest, clearest fairest, because you can measure what's fair and what's not. As I said before, the wealthy in the community are paying eight cents per dollar, are low and moderate income paying a 13. You know what's fair. You can evaluate, you can uh, uh, judge uh, as you go through how much success you're, you're, you're obtaining. It's well, a that's great, great area to spend a lot of time in if you're interested in economic justice. Uh, well, I am, and, and you know, I'm interested in taxation too, so I really appreciate mm -hmm. this discussion very mm -hmm. much, actually. Um, and uh, we're coming to the end of our show. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much. As I said during the break, I want to thank you so much for many years of public service. Well, it's my privilege. very laudable. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for coming on the show. It's been fascinating, riveting, yeah. actually. Yeah. Thank you. Real, real pleasure. Thank you very Good. much for the Good. invitation. If anybody's out there and wants to participate, take a look at our website, Hawaii uh, uh, Appleseed Center uh, for Law and Economic Justice. Uh, uh, the bills are spelled out. Uh, Reports are written, quite a wealth of information for people that want to be participating in the process this year. Good.